How's everybody doing today? Awesome. <clears throat> today is, does anybody know what today is? Palm Sunday, first day of Holy Week. Jesus is entering into Jerusalem on a humble donkey uh, as a king to, to free Israel from their, from their oppressors, to free uh, Israel's people from slavery and from oppression. Um, and so we are beginning this week, hopefully in our, in our devotional, in our thinking, in our prayers, remembering Jesus with the, with the climax being at his death and resurrection at the end of the week. Um, so this is why we have the palm tree set up as, as a form of remembrance. Um, but uh, starting today, we're, we're going to be in Deuteronomy. Next week, we're going to be uh, worshiping, celebrating Easter together as a family. And then the following week, we will conclude our sermon in the Pentateuch in the book of Deuteronomy. Uh, I, I'm a little bit excited about Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy to me is, is one of my favorite books of, of the law, of the first five books of the Bible in particular. Um, because it's, it's, it kind of gives a, the big overall picture of what's the point of the law. If you ever sit down with a lawyer, let's say you have a lawyer, and they put a big stack of like legal documents in front of you, and there's a lawyer sitting there, what would you rather do? Would you rather read the big stack of documents or get the summary from the lawyer? Summary, summary right? I don't, I'm not interested in the documents. To me, but, but you still kind of have to know the details of the documents, right? Like you still have to be aware of that. So you're relying on the lawyer to teach you the contents of the documents. The, the book of Deuteronomy functions that way. You have these Let's just be honest. Exodus and Leviticus for us is kind of boring, right? You got the boring and numbers. Even more boring. So you got, you got these three kind of boring parts of the Old Testament, but Deuteronomy is basically the lawyer that's explaining what those th for other three books are about. And in my opinion, it gives more life. There's two major themes that we're going to look at um, over the, the course of these two weeks. We're going to look at the character of God and the mission of God. Because at the end of the day, that is what the law is trying to communicate to us. Who is this holy God that we worship? What is his character? What is he about? And then what is he asking Israel to do? And then, of course, that for us means what is he asking the church to do? What is he asking us to be? And how is God moving in the works in the midst of all of that? So today we're going to look at the character of God. And in particular, I want us to think about the character of God through the lens of love. We, we've, we've listened to, we've all listened to sermons about love. We all have memorized at least 20 or 30 love songs. Uh, we've at least said I love you to one person and have heard it from one person. Um, we, some of us have our own conceptions of what love is. Um, but really the heartbeat of the character of God is his physical, tangible expression and experience of love. Um, if somebody says I love you, but there's no, even, even in sentimental ways, they'll take you on a, on a date or they'll do something nice for you. But there's no like, there's no like really, real like committal expression of it. You start to question whether the words are true. For example, when Irene and I first started dating, I mean, two weeks after we started dating, there was a major death in my family. It was a really big deal for all of us in the family. Um, and we had made plans for the funeral to go up to the funeral. And she knew about some of the details. But on her own, her own, her own will, her own volition, she decided she was going to take the day off of work. It was on a Thursday, I think, maybe a Friday. That's when the, the funeral was. She was going to take that day off of work, and she was going to go with me to the funeral if I wanted her to. She didn't impose it upon me. She didn't say, I'm going. She said, look, I took the time off of work already. I'm making myself available. I'll go with you if you want me to go. Now, this was a big deal for me because this is a big loss of the family, and nobody has really ever extended themselves like that before. And frankly, she'd only been dating me for like a week or two, right? Like, this could have been her, and, oh, oh, I'm missing a big detail. This is the first time she's going to meet everybody in my family, right? <laughs> this is a big deal. This is a, this is a, this is a big step. So, I mean, she, she can get out of this any time, but she's, I mean, once she, like, once you kind of meet, like, major major members of the family. It's like, so for her, that would be a lot of pressure. But for me, it felt like even more pressure. Because I'm like, are you sure you want to meet them? Like, <laughs> I know them. You don't. But she stuck with it. And I said, yeah, I mean, I would, I would absolutely love it. It was a really, really big thing for me. Um, I don't remember, but I think I had cried at least three quarters of the drive up and back. Um, it was really, really important. From that second on, I, I think before then, but really from that second on, I'm marrying this girl, right? And if I don't marry this girl, there's, then I'm never getting married. Like, this is the, this is the, 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 uh, the creme de la creme of women 
in my book. But for her to do that, there was no other expression of love that I could have experienced at that time. And, and that, to me, was a testament to her character. That was who she is. And most of you know my wife, and you would probably say the same thing about her as well. That's free. <laughs> so as we start thinking then in terms of the book of Deuteronomy, we start thinking in terms of the law. But more importantly, as we start thinking in our own lives about the character of God, and we say, yes, God loves you, or we want to experience the love of God, I think it's important that we start, we start creating frameworks and pictures, and, and we start making God more tangible with that, with that communication. How many of us have heard from people the words, God loves you, um, but, but then you see their lives don't actually re- reflect or express the love of God. Or we've experienced that own conflict in our, in our own lives, right? How many times have I said, I, God loves you to somebody, only to not re- be the best reflection of that to somebody else? And so we want to make sure that the way that we live our lives also reflects the way that we think of and conceptualize the, the concept of God. And so the book of Deuteronomy, um, it begins in chapter 1 through 5 kind of doing some some introductory type stuff. And then in chapter 5, they, there's, a, there's a recital of the law. The, the, uh, Moses kind of recites the, or the, uh, the Ten Commandments, excuse me. He recites the Ten Commandments. And then from chapter 6 all the way through the rest of Deuteronomy, it's essentially a commentary of the law, right? You got the big lawyer packet on the desk, and then you got the lawyer sitting next to the, the big pack of, uh, of documents. 6 through 30, then, is the lawyer explaining the documents to you. Giving, putting life to the law. What does this actually mean for us? And then when we get to chapter 6, there's a really, really important part that I want us to read together. Uh, it's called the Shema. The Shema is the Hebrew word for the, for the, for the verb hear. Hear, O Israel. Hear also can be translated as obey. Listen, pay attention. This is really, really important. And it was so important for them that actually in about the second century, second century, a rabbi developed the practice of covering his eyes whenever he would recite the Shema. Because he didn't want anything to distract him from focusing his entire attention on these words of the law. It was the most important thing to him. And as we'll see in, in the Shema in a little bit, they recited it morning and night with their family in the synagogue. It was it shaped, it put structure around who is God and why do we worship him and how do we reflect him to the world. Now notice what I said is that when they put the blinders on, they weren't reading, they were reciting it. They were memorizing it. It's a spiritual formation practice that says, as I repeat these words over and over and over and over again, I'm going to be formed more and more into the image of God. So I want us to read, there's, there's, there's two major chunks to the Shema. We're only going to look at the first five verses, so uh, we'll have it on the screen. It's Hebrew, or, excuse me, Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 through 9. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. There's a lot more to this, but that's the major thrust of the Shema. These commandments I just, I just told you about in chapter 5 and that we've read, that we've read in, in the book of Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers, this Shema is this, 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 this idea of a creed. It's the major overall set of beliefs and ide- uh, that shapes our ideology. It shapes our life. It shapes the way that we think. It shapes the way that we speak. It is everything to us. It's a creed. It's a creedal statement. And this is important. A creed is a set of beliefs which guides and forms a specific uh, person and community. We all have a creed individually and as a church, whether we know it or not. There are certain ideals that we will live by. We will not break on them. There are certain ways that we choose to, to raise our families. There are certain forms of work ethic. Um, there, there might be political convictions. There are certainly religious convictions in the church. These are things by which, I guess you could say, these are hills that we are willing to die on. These are non-negotiables. So this Shema, is, it, it served as that, that purpose for Israel. And this particular creed is, is, establishes the uniqueness of Israel's God between him and his people. That's the, what's most, most important about it. Israel was already in the midst of a world and a culture that believed in many different gods. 
And those gods did many different things depending on how you appeased them. Israel still certainly believed and expected other gods to be working in their life and in their world. That's why the golden calf incident in the book of Exodus is so radically important to the story. It's their idea of trying to insert another god into the world that which Yahweh, their god, was to be acting and working on their behalf. That's why it was, so, that why it was such a big deal and so scandalous. And so what, what God is doing in, in creating the commandments and creating this people is he's asking them fundamental questions about who he is, but more importantly, what he did for them. Did the gods of Egypt free you from slavery? Did the gods of Canaan or Moab protect and provide for you while you were in the wilderness? No, I did that. And what's even, what's even really cool if we really think about this, where did, where did Israel come from? They weren't their own nation. They weren't their own people in their own right. right? They were these, this nomadic people from this patriarch named Abram in the land of Ur kind of wandering about. This holy, omniscient, wonderful God chooses this one man out of all the people in the world and says, I'm going to form a unique, distinct people out of you. And not only that, you are going to be the visible manifestation and presence of my goodness to all of the world. That's really cool. Because what he's saying is he's not doing an us versus them thing. He's kind of taking this, this other route. I'm not going to choose Moab. I'm not going to choose Canaan. I'm not going to choose Egypt. I'm going to choose this one man, and I'm going to form my own people, my own group. But not, to, not for them to live in isolation, but to show the rest of the world what they're missing out on, how good this God really is. And so therefore, Israel is to love God because he first loved them. He saved them from slavery, from genocide. He saved them from oppression. He provided for them in a wilderness, in the desert. Have you ever been stuck in the desert without water? Hopefully not. But if you do, it's bad. (laughs) Have you ever been starving in the desert? I hope not. I haven't. I don't want to do that. But we all, we've all seen that movie. <laughs> we've all seen that TV show. That's a bad situation. But God provided for them, even in the midst of some of their grumbling. He followed through. Is that not the greatest tangible expression of love? And at any point during the scenario, if any of us have read this, we know, God could have and probably should have bailed on them. He should have said, okay, you guys are too much. You guys are, gr- you guys are you're grumbling, you're, you're complaining, you're not recognizing the goodness of my love in all of this situation, I'm out. Now, yes, he did certainly punish them in certain situations, but he was committed to that covenant, his faithfulness, through all of those different, th- those different aspects of their, their wilderness experience. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. In verse 5, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. Everything that you are, you are to love him. Why? Because he had loved you. Everything that he has done for you, you are to continue to reflect that back to him. And what's really cool is the the unique qualities of, of God's redemption of Israel is really, again, is to result in an unqualified love and commitment back to God. This is seen actually in the next chapter, in verse 9 of chapter 7, where God declares, Know therefore that the Lord your God is God. He is the faithful God, keeping his covenant of love to a thousand generations of those who love him and keep his commandments. Now this kind of seems like a little bit of like a, a quid pro quo, right? God will only love you if you love him back. But we have to kind of look at the perspective and the dynamic here. How would you not want to love this God? Right? Because if you say, I don't love this God, in that world, in that culture, right, atheism or secularism as we know today wasn't a category. If you don't love this God, that means you're going to love, you're going to love this God over here. And you're saying, this God, Yahweh can't provide for me, so the gods of Canaan and Moab and Egypt, they will provide for me. And so he's asking the question, how, how have they been doing so far? And we read certain words here, we'll look at in a little bit in chapter 30, where it's like, if you don't follow me, this, these are some bad things that are going to happen. They weren't things that necessarily he had to impose on them. Because if they stayed in Egypt, Egypt was going to kill them. Egypt was going to destroy them. They would be doing that to themselves. God is saying, love me, give, your, give, give yourself to me just as a natural, normal response to my faithfulness and how good I am. I mean, just imagine this, imagine this, this, this scenario for a second. And I realize all examples sort of break down somewhere, but hear me out. 
you're, you're in the thick of it in life, right? Things are just really, really bad for you. You can't hold a job. You, 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 you're, you're massively in debt. Um, you're having some relationship issues, friends and family. And the only thing that gets you through your day is going to the local pub and having a couple drinks. That's the only thing you want to do. You want to have a couple Jack and Cokes hold the Cokes, right? That's, that's going to get you through your day. And out of nowhere, the CEO of a major company that's a, a, a competitor to your company sits next to you and starts striking up a conversation with you. And out of nowhere, he, he listens to your story. He's listening intently. You're listening to his story. You listen intently. And he says, you know what? I, I want to hire you on. And I want to, not only do I want to hire you on, I want to pay, I want, I want to, pay, you know, give you a fair salary. I want to pay off some of your debt. Um, but I want to make you a manager. I want to make you the face and representation of this company. And you're pushing back. You're arguing. That doesn't make sense. I don't have any experience. There's no reason why I should do that. You're, you're grumbling the entire time. You're complaining. But this guy is patient with you. And you still can't figure out why. So at this point, you say, okay, I'll go ahead and do it. You, you, you get hired on, just thinking that's it. But not only, not only that, but he's going he's gonna to train you and walk you through the entire A to Z of the entire company. He wants to put you as the face of marketing. He wants to put you as the, uh, in charge of everybody that's working at this company. And you're, wondering, you're waiting for the other shoe to drop, right? Okay, this is way too good to be true. There's no way this guy is going to keep up this shtick for long enough. And then finally he tells you, okay, there is one thing I want you to do in return. I want you to stay loyal to this company. I just want you to work here as long as possible, preferably until you need to retire. You're going to have other people knock on the door because I'm going to pay you well. You're going to do really well. I'm going to train and walk with you through this thing. But you just promise me you're not going to quit. Just stick it out. Stick it all the way through. And if somebody offers you more money, you talk, talk to me. We'll figure it out. I'll pay you more money. I want you to be happy here, and I want you to be the face of this company to the world. That's the only thing I'm asking. Now, there could still be some bad things that pop up down the road, right? A lot of us are cynical in this situation. But I think you would be a fool not to take that, take that gig, right? If you're the thing getting you through the week is that Jack and Coke hold the Coke, and this guy is going to offer you everything that you need and more, isn't it worth the shot? Isn't it just worth the gamble? Isn't it worth the risk, even if it could end up? What's the worst case that scenario? The guy fires you, and you're right back where you started? I kind of, I, in my mind, is how I'm conceptualizing this relationship between God and Israel. You have absolutely nothing to lose because he's already given everything to you anyway. Now we're talking about God. We're not talking about the CEO of a business, a fallible individual. We're talking about the person who created the heavens and earth and all that it contains. And he's cultivated his own people whom he loves to display his love to the rest of the world. It's a good gamble. It's a good risk. This is how the love of God is to function. And this is how we are to tangibly display that. And in among the various ways Israel was to remember the faithfulness of this God, or the faithfulness of God in particular, was to impress these things upon their children and the, and, and the rest of the people. That word impress, to repeat again and again and again and again, never stopping. Remember, remembering who God is. When you sit down at home, you are to repeat the Shema. You are to repeat this creed. When you rock a walk around, repeat this creed. When you go to bed and when you wake up in the morning, repeat this creed. Put these words on your mouth. Repeat them. Tie this creed to your head. Tie these, hands to your, to, tie these words to your, to, your, to your hands. Put it on your door frame. Recite it. Memorize it. Drive it into your brain. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. Why? Because he's done the same thing for you. It's so good. It's so good. Can I get a witness? Can I get, can I get an amen? I need an amen right now. This is good. This creed, this Shema, this is the basis of our formation as a people, as a church, as a community. When you talk about God to your friends or to your family, to your children, are you remembering the goodness and the faithfulness of God and who he is and how he's displayed that to you? Or has it just become a mundane religious activity? Is it just something you were told that you need to, to believe in and accept? Or have you experienced it yourself? God is, is, is active and he's moving in the life of his people as we see in the Old Testament. But naturally this is going to continue on into the church. The character of God was experiential 
first and foremost, to Israel. There's, there's different wings of the church today that, that will either, either accept or reject the place that experience has in our lives. And often in our culture, experience isn't enough to, to quantitatively accept the, the presence and the power and existence of God, right? It has to be rational. It has to be, right? It has to be worked through thinking and logic and philosophy and theology and, and all of those things. And all of those things are good and true and, and, and excellent. But experience has to have some place, some form, form in our love and acceptance of who God is. Otherwise, those words, those ideas, the philosophies, all of those things, they're not pointless, but they don't have substance behind them. They don't have proof behind them. How do you know that the God you're telling me about is real if you've never experienced him? How could Israel accept this God if he didn't do for them what he did for them? I think experience is very, very important, and we need to listen and learn to that. God wants to create magnificent experiences in our life that will connect him back to us. This might be supernatural type stuff, unexplainable type stuff. But even if it is explainable and rational in our world, it's experiential. We can connect it to the love and the presence of God. And I think that is very important. Furthermore, God promises to bless Israel in the new land he's leading them into should they continue to recite the Shema, to recite this creed, to live this creed out in everyday life. And so he says in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 11 through 14, oops. Now what I am commanding you today is not too difficult for you or beyond your reach. It is not up in heaven so that you have to ask, who will ascend into heaven to get it and proclaim it to us so we may obey it? Nor is it beyond the sea so that you have to ask, Who will cross the sea to get it and proclaim it to us so we may obey it? No, the word is very near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart so that you may obey it. It's everything you need to know is contained right here in this creed, right? You don't need to go searching and digging through all the different documents of the law. The lawyer has explained very, very clear. If you commit to the words of the Shema, you preach these to your children, you teach these things to your community, you you live by them, you recite them, then everything contained in these documents, these law documents, it's right there. It's right there in the midst. You won't have to question what the rest of the law is actually talking about. You know it. And so we read these words as the church. And we say, man, that's, that's really good. That's really cool. I, I like that. I can, I can get behind that. But how does that explain the love of God to me today? None of us are wandering in the wilderness. None of us were slaves in, in Egypt. None of us are, I would I say, at least maybe, at least most of us are not battling or warring with other gods. How do we deal, how do we connect to this, to this today? Well, naturally, as a church, we have to find our connection to Christ. What does Jesus have to say about this? Remember, in Matthew 5, Jesus is the fulfillment of the law, right? He fulfilled the law and the prophets and all that it contains in there. How is this contained in the life of Jesus? We, too, then, get to experience the same covenantal faithfulness, the relentless love of God fulfilled and manifested in the presence of Israel through Jesus. And we see this most explicitly in Matthew 24, or excuse me, Matthew 22, verses 34 through 40. There's this contentious scene that's happening before here where the Pharisees and the Sadducees and their chief priests and the experts in the law, all the powerful, all the powerful people of Israel are p- putting pressure on Jesus, putting pressure on him to, 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 to find something in his communication or his work that's going to cause him to slip up so they can put him to death. And he's just not giving in. He's not giving in. And finally, in verse 34 of chapter 22, one of the experts of the law says this to Jesus. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the the Pharisees got together, and this expert in the law tested him with this question, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Does that sound familiar? Jesus is affirming to those that are trying to test him, 
They're trying to trap him. They're trying to get him, bait him so that he could say something bad. He, he repeats the Shema. He repeats the creed of Israel. This is the greatest of all of the laws. But Jesus wasn't the first one in Israel to say that, those things. They all would have affirmed that. Yeah, that is the greatest and most important commandment. But where Jesus then goes a little bit to the right of them is it was when he says that second part. And the second is like it. It is just like it. It's not a lesser form. It's not a greater form. It is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. See, the Pharisees got the love of God part right. They used to wear these things called phylacteries. They would put the Shema or the law on their foreheads. They would wrap them around on their wrists. A lot of uh, Hasidic and Orthodox Jews still do this today. They would recite the Shema. They would remember it. They would cover their eyes just like that rabbi did in the second century. They would recite these things over and over and over again. They loved God and they loved the law. But as we see in stories such as the Good Samaritan, they did not love people. They loved their people for their own means, for their own ends, but they didn't love everybody else. They were not committed to loving everybody else. They were not reflecting the love of God that they thought they experienced in in the wilderness to the rest of Israel. It it was about getting what they wanted. And by Jesus establishing the second part of the greatest commandment, we were seeing not, not, not Jesus just attributing Israel's creed to himself, but creating his own creed, Jesus' own creed. To love the Lord with heart, soul, and mind is, again, to love neighbor as ourselves, friends, enemies alike. That is Jesus' creed. And as followers of Christ, then, we pay attention to that. We recite that. We listen to those words, and we let that penetrate our mind and our hearts. And we see where it conflicts, and it challenges our own perceptions of how this world is supposed to work. What are the other things that are vying for our attention? What are the other gods that are trying to get us to distract us from following the one true God of Israel, the following Christ? We we recite this in our mind over and over and over again. I have somebody in my life, a friend or an enemy, um, who, who I don't like, I despise, they don't like me. What am I supposed to do? I recite Jesus' creed over and over and over and over again to this point that I start embodying these things. I start believing, not only do I believe it, But it's a part of my character. It's a part of who I am. Friends, this is a beautiful thing. This is a wonderful thing. But it's a challenging thing. Because sometimes the church doesn't function like this. I've struggled with this preparing the sermon this week, by the way. I've read those words. I've read these words multiple, multiple times. I've said them to people. I've summarized the law for people by using Jesus' own words, only to find out, I don't know if I am loving my my neighbor and my enemy as myself. That's not true. I know that I am not loving my friend and my enemy as myself. It's painful to say that and admit that, but it's true. And that is what Jesus is calling us to do. So when we read the law, or we think about the implications of the law, or we think about, more importantly, what it means to love and follow God in light of everything we read in the Bible, that is, that is where it's all contained. James Dunn says it this way, he, uh, Jesus set forth love of neighbor as a principle which showed how the law should be observed in the light of the circumstances, rather than as a rule to be obeyed whatever the circumstances. That's important. We've often heard that cliche term, it's all about obeying the spirit of the law, not the letter of the law. This is the spirit of the law, loving God and loving people. And that's what it means to obeying the law. And what is the law? Loving God and loving people. That's what it is. We can get hung up in the mundane details of of all of the little things of the law or all the little things of the Christian faith, what we're supposed to do, what we're not supposed to do. But there's a really simple rubric by which we measure all of these things. Are we loving God with our heart, mind, soul, and strength? and, And or are we loving other people? If the answer is no at any point, we are not we are not participating in Jesus' creed. I think this has massive implications for us as a church because I think there's ultimately, this is a bit of an exaggeration, but I think ultimately there's two groups of people in here. Some of us love the love God part. Yes, I I love God. I pray every single day, multiple times a day. I read and study my Bible. I've got a what would Jesus do bumper sticker on my car, right? I am a love God person. You don't have to question that with me. 
But when it comes to loving people, we put, we put brackets around that. Certain people, some, pe- some neighbors, some friends, some family. S- yeah, maybe enemies, but they got to kind of gotta keep, keep a distance. We're not too excited about that. There's also love people people. We, we love people. We have a deep passion for serving other people. I, I, we will give our last daughter, daughter, dollar, excuse me. <laughs> I have one. I'm not getting rid of her. Sorry. We will give our last dollar. We will give the shirt off our back. <laughs> we, we can edit that part out, right? I'm not giving my daughter away. I feel very confident about that. We will do anything we possibly can for the benefit of others. But loving, loving God in a traditional sense, prayers, even belief in God, commitment to God, yeah, that's important, right? I gotta love God, yeah. But, but I gotta love, I gotta just, I'm all about people, people, right? I mean, there's a, the, the Pharisees would have loved God with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength, right? They did it, they explained it. And we see Pharisees in the Bible as the, I mean, they are the main antagonists of the story, but in their culture, I mean, the, the Pharisees weren't bad people. Right? They, they shepherded, they protected aspects of what it meant to worship God. But there's a lot of people in our world today, again, that do a lot of amazing things, but they detest the very God who created the people that they claim to love. Right? Church or outside the church, it doesn't matter. But those are, those are false dichotomies. If we say that we love God, but we're not too crazy about people, we have to be careful because we may not actually love God. That's not, a, that's not a matter of judgment. That's a matter of paying attention to the creed of Jesus. When he says the greatest commandment is loving God, and just like it, the second one is loving people, we got to take that up with Jesus. And that's where my conviction is. I can wrestle with that all day long. And i got some difficult people I'm, I'm kind of working through in my life right now. I'm trying to think through these things. But he's not giving me a way out. There's no wiggle room. He's then, his communication to me in dealing with difficult people and to stay the course, stay at it, keep grinding through it. That's what you're called and committed to do. Jesus says in John 14, verse 15, if you love me, keep my commandments, keep my creed. You love Jesus, you listen to him. And how do we love him? In 1 John 3, 16 through 18, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need, but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. This this is weighty stuff, because I know I'm not the only one that's struggling through this right now. I know I'm not the only one grinding through this right now. There's like 60 of you in here, and I'm pretty sure we got 100% uh, problem rate here with this, right? (laughs) All of us are thinking at some level, there's a friend or a neighbor or an enemy that I am not loving, that that Jesus is telling me to stay the course. And I'm trying to, I'm looking for that rabbit trail off the course. But he's saying, stick with it. This is what it means to love me. The first part of our mission statement Uh, here at communion is practicing the way of Jesus. Most mission statements in businesses and in churches are kind of cheesy, pithy little one-liners, right? We love God, right? But there's no expression. How do you love God? We want to love our city, but how are we going to love our city? We're working through that as as church leadership and trying to find ways to, 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 to express that as a church, right? How do we love God and love our city and love people and be the church and all this stuff? I want to try, to try to get the conversation started of what does this mean then for us as a church to practice the way of Jesus? I think first and foremost, always as with everything, we need to read and wrestle through the words of Jesus in the four Gospels, not in isolation, but together as a church family. It's easy to read the Bible in our closets, in our rooms, without interacting with people who think differently from us or might read things a little bit differently, or have a different angle, or a different set of convictions about what we're reading. We need to read these things together as a family. Large chunks, chapters, awkward. One person's falling asleep, right? This is too long. Wake up, buttercup. We're reading these large chunks together, 
We're grinding through this together. These are the words of Jesus. He's our Lord. He's our King. He's our God. He loved us. He redeemed us. Let's listen to him. Let's pay attention. And then let's discuss these things. What is he saying? What do you like? What don't you like? I don't like he's telling me to read my, love my neighbor as myself or my, or my enemies. I don't like that. How can we serve each other through that? How can we walk through that? Because we have to at least acknowledge that it's saying that and that it's important. I think the second thing is the creed of the Shema stated how the patriarch of the home was to constantly communicate the love of God and his faithfulness con- continuously, right? When you wake up in the morning, when you go to bed at night, um, when you're walking down the street, you put it on your door frame, you put it on your head, your hands. I mean, the words of this creed is everywhere. And a lot of us with, with, with family, with kids, we've created certain practices, right? We'll, we'll say our prayers together. We'll read a Bible story together. Um, if, if any of you with kids don't have the Jesus storybook we have out in the lobby, take that and bring that home to your kids. It's an amazing way to communicate the Bible stories to, to our children. But sometimes we stop at the home level and that's it. But what if we, what if we communicate and recite the Shema or Jesus' uh, um, interpretation of the Shema to one another? I mean, this, this is essentially the gospel, right? The love of Christ was fulfilled in the, in the death and resurrection of who Jesus is. As Jesus is the fulfillment of Israel's expectations of, of um, a king coming to set them free. That's what the Shema is, 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 is essentially communicating. What if we continuously preach the gospel to one another? Communicate the gospel and the Shema to one another? What if the only thing that we say to somebody, if, somebody's, if we're griping to somebody about somebody else, we're griping to somebody about whether or not uh, um, God is real or active, is we say, you know what? Love the Lord your God with your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. What if that was the only form of communication we needed? And we said it so often that we're like, okay, I know it's coming. I don't want to hear it, but that's what I need to hear. We're communicating these things constantly. We're developing a language that says Jesus is king, and therefore I need to love him and love other people as a response to this king. I think the byproduct of that would be this this radically, almost supernatural, gospel-shaped community where anybody that comes into this church is just going to get hit with the love of God and love of people. That's the only way we want anybody to get hit in here. (laughs) That way. And I think that could happen. And third and lastly, and I've repeated this a few times, but it bears its own point, (laughs) is we need to love all people. We need to love all people. Not just some, not just the ones we like, but all of them. Loving all people does not need to be qualified. And we want to qualify. We want to put people in categories. I know I do. But people are not an issue or a means to an end. People... People are to be placed at the highest value, at the highest level than, than anything else in our lives. No, no matter what you view, no matter how you view them, no matter how these people function and, and, and participate in our culture and society, there has something that has to be said that the least, the least will be first in the kingdom and the first will be last. There's something that has to be said about that here and now. We love to put the, 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 the first at the top but we have to put all people at the top. And frankly, again, a lot of us heard this message, and there's probably a lot of amens, but then when we get to the loving people part, we're like, ah. It's the hardest part. Sometimes it's difficult. And it's difficult because it involves vulnerability and disagreement. That's what it, that's, that's what it takes. Right? We have to expose, we have to put ourselves out there to love people we don't normally love, and we have to be willing to accept that these people may not think and act like us or look like us. But there's no qualifications for this. But I think by doing this, we're then going to establish and create a church community that's going to reflect the intentions that God had for Israel. To reflect his goodness, his faithfulness, his glory to the rest of the world. I want to invite the band to come up now. But I want us to, I want us to really think about that. I want us to personalize this for a second. How many of us have said the words, I love you to somebody, but have never actually expressed tangible, true service, laying down of your life for that person? Or how many of us are involved with people who will say they love you to you, but you've never experienced that in return? 
It's painful, isn't it? It's painful to think about. I got about four or five people in my mind right now where that, it's happening one way or the other, where I, if I really truly think about it, I am not really communicating I love you to them. I might say it, might be involved in their lives, but I don't know if I'm really truly living that out. And there's a good group of people that, have, that say it to me, it's not my wife, that say it to me, <laughs> that really aren't truly living that out. And that's painful. I want to offer some encouragement, though. Stay the course. Stay the course. Commit to the creed. Commit to Jesus' creed. Listen to him. Learn from him. Let the Spirit establish his presence in your life individually and this life as a church. Let's let this church have its own communication that is, that is creedal, that is the Jesus creed, where our set of beliefs, our ideologies, are firmly grounded in the person and work of Christ and what he did in our lives. If this is something that this topic is something you want to kind of explore a little bit more, there is a great book. Guess what it's called? The Jesus Creed. <laughs> that explores in a little bit more in depth what it means for Jesus to embody Israel's creed, the Shema, and then what are the implications for you and I as followers of Jesus. Um, I looked, there's one more at the library in the Welcome Center, so you can fight for it at the end. Don't hit, but you can fight for it. Um, if you're interested in reading that book and you'd like to dig a little bit deeper and you're actually going to read it, please come see me and I would be glad to buy you one. Um, but... We need to start honing in on this, loving each, other, loving each other as the church, reflecting the goodness of God, and therefore loving God um, as a result. Please join me in prayer. Father, I, we, we, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for the ability to worship you with our minds, with our hearts, with our experiences, to reflect on the goodness of who you are and your love. Lord, I pray that by, by the power of your spirit that you would convict and lead and direct other people in here um, to experience this love for themselves, but then also to be a manifestation of this love out in, the, in their community, in their jobs, in their schools, their families. That there would this be this, this, this radical movement of a Jesus creed-shaped community that would love God and love people. We love you, Lord. We thank you, and we ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen.